Good evening, and welcome to the faculty and staff reading of the Solstice MFA program Summer 2021 Virtual Residency, which also marks the program's 15th year. I'm Quentin Collins, the Assistant Director. If you would like to utilize the closed captions, there is an option on the taskbar along the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Tonight, you will hear a sampling of three minute readings from Solstice instructors, as well as staff members. For tonight's reading, we'll proceed in this order. Josh Neufeld, Meg Carney, Steve Huff, Anne-Marie Oman, Laura Williams McCaffrey, Randall Horton, Sterling Watson, Amy Hoffman, myself, Quentin Collins, Ian Haley Pollock, David Yu, and then we'll conclude with Laurent Basilar. Each reader will be introduced by a Solstice community member via a pre-recorded introduction. And we are gonna begin with alum Jonathan Todd introducing Josh Neufeld. Hi, my name is Jonathan Todd and I'm a Solstice alumnus. Josh Neufeld's AD, New Orleans After the Deluge, nonfiction graphic novel makes you an eyewitness of catastrophe alongside people who went through Hurricane Katrina. With Josh's skill, you forget that you're reading and interpreting marks on paper, but those marks transform into real people you're watching cope with Katrina. AD is comics journalism. Comics journalism is reporting news using the comics medium. So in addition to quoting sources, the cartoonist draws the sources from a researcher to an eyewitness. In addition to AD, Josh illustrated the influencing machine, Brooke Gladstone on the media and co-edited Flashed, Seven Stories in Comics and Prose. Josh has also produced comics for Columbia Journalism Review, Foreign Policy Magazine, and other venues. I guess that's my cue. Um, that's a great introduction. I'm going to actually share a piece of memoir uh, that I did some years back, but it being Father's Day recently um, reminded me of this piece which is called Father Figures. Um, this is how the piece actually looks uh, in its full form, uh, one of the pages, but I'm gonna read it to you um, in panel by panel sequence, just to make it easier so you can see the pictures. <clears throat> and let me know if the um, panels are not advancing and you're not seeing each new um, screen. Um, as I was growing up, basically raised by my mom, a lot of men passed through my life father figures. Age two, dad takes off. I just don't think I'm cut out to be a father. Age three, unclear on the concept, dada, celery. Age four to five, Reuben, a doctor who liked my mom and my drawings. Age six, dad, back for a visit, scared the cat, Hello, I'm your father. Seven, Daniel, jumped our car battery, asked for my mom's number, which I shouted out. Mom not thrilled, but he took us out to a nice meal. Ages seven to 11, Alan, argued about marks with my mom over dinner. Age eight, dad with wife number two, took me in for a year, bought me comics, removed a splinter, took me to see Blazing Saddles. Ages nine to 11, Austin and Paul, housemates, took me to the beach, played pranks, treated me like their little brother. I see, said the blind man. Ages nine to 11, Phil, our other housemate, tapped his cereal down below the milk, used ketchup and mayo to make smiley faces on his burger patties. Ages nine to 13, dad, for a month each summer, fed me steak and chicken, taught me to play baseball. That's it, keep your eye on the ball. 
age eight to 11 to 13. Bob took me to Candlestick Park, championed Little League, barber haircuts, Adidas sneakers. Age 13, Michael, a grad student who hung around for a while. Ages 14 to 17, dad with wife number three and new baby took me in for high school. Ages 14 to 20, Hawkeye, cracked wise, yet able to cry, loved and respected women. My kidneys were expecting orange juice, silly kidneys. Ages 14 to 21, John, came with a dog and a country house, taught me to play squash. There you go, keep your eye on the ball. Age 40, Josh, Dad to the fifth divided by wife squared uh, plus mom divided by boyfriends to the seventh times dog plus housemates to the third divided by baseball plus comics times celery plus steak times blazing saddles plus mash equals me. Phoebe, 10 months. Dada. Thank you. Good evening, Solstice residents, writers, and friends. I'm Beth Haverkamp Powers, second semester poetry students. Tonight, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce founding director of the Solstice MFA in creative writing, Meg Carney. I first met Meg at the Frost Place in Northern New Hampshire. And as many here know, the ethos of that en and enchantment of that place lives and breathes at the Solstice program. In addition to her administ administrative wizardry, Meg is an astounding poet in her own right, producing books for children, young adults, and most recently, two astonishing works of poetry, The Ice Storm, A Crown of Sonnets, and the 2020 Washington Prize winning book, All Morning the Crows. Without further ado, let's take flight with Meg. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Beth, for that introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. And the Frost Place has given me many gifts and uh, you are one of them. Um, and what a, a pleasure and honor it is to read tonight with my colleague, Quentin Collins, and all of the amazing faculty members uh, teaching this summer fall for the Solstice MFA program. I'm going to just read um, two poems from my book that's just out that Beth mentioned, All Morning the Crows. And the first one is, is the opening poem to the book titled Owl. Owl. She birthed you, but she is so unknowable. Is that the word? Try nocturnal. Each night she glides on wings silent as a vole quivering under snow. Perched on your bedroom sill, she watches you dream twitch, then spins her head to spy the snow mound ripple, sugary in moonlight as the vole tunnels under pines. She lifts off silent still and you, daughter of hurt and squeal, are awake. When you sigh, your heart-shaped face aches. Is that the word? Try breaks, knowing when she dies, you'll inherit all she's swallowed whole, yet had to leave behind. And sticking with another poem that's early on in the book, um, this is Loon. Loon. 
I bought a cassette tape of loon calls so I could speak their language that summer I camped on Russet Pond. This was the 80s, so cassette tapes were the thing. Side A was for where are you, I am here, or I am hungry calls, meaning hoots, whales, and peeps. Side B was for aggression and distress, yodels and tremolos, the latter a kind of alarm laugh that led to the saying, crazy as a loon. Kids today don't have the chance to choose between side A and B. B, the poor man's intermission or a sleeper song's second chance. But now I'm talking 45 records, 1972, with deeper and deeper on the B side of Billy Don't Be a Hero, which was more a tremolo than a yodel, a sentimental, romantic, anti-war song that slew my heart in third grade. No one I knew liked deeper and deeper, Though on Russet Pond, I learned that loons with their solid bones can dive deeper and longer than most birds. And I found I preferred whales to tremolos. Whales being the kind of call I'd perfected myself by then. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Kemsky, and I'm a second semester fiction student. And I'm so pleased to introduce the next reader, faculty member Steve Huff. Steve Huff is a jack of all literary trades, and in my opinion, a master of them all. A Pushcart Prize winner for fiction, he's the author of two collections of stories, three collections of poems, and a collection of essays. He's the founding publisher and editor of Tiger Bark Press, and his work has appeared in Plowshares, The Hudson Review, Kestrel, The Chautauqua Literary Review, Ted Kooser's American Life and Poetry column, among many others. More importantly, Steve is a beloved Pine Manor teacher and mentor. As much of a fan as I am of Steve's writing, a masterful blend of absurdist humor, simple yet profound insights, and timeless wisdom, it's his generosity, his eagle eye, and his passion and love for all things literary that fuels me as a developing writer and makes me aspire to put as much good work into the world as he has. Without further ado, Steve Huff. Nicole, thank you. Thank you so much for that. For that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Meg and Quentin, for all you do and, and all of you for being here with us. This is chapter part of chapter 17 from my novel, The Best Man I Know. Um, Jude is a young teen who was orphaned when his mother was murdered. He goes to live with an aunt in Florida. And when he, when he meets her, he's startled to realize that he has an aunt who is an African-American. Nanny Grace Horton is a kind of lioness. She's a Christian litter bug. She dumps thousands of gospel tracts on the road. And she's also the local exorcist and has lately performed an exorcism on a young woman named Dory. Um, I guess you started something, Nanny Grace said, hanging up the phone. Mrs. Towner and her neighbor, they want you to get down there now and mow for them again. Can I do it after we do your littering? That's what you call it? I can do that on my own. Go on and don't disappoint those ladies. You're gonna have the whole neighborhood looking decent. She picked her keys from the wall book and started out. Lock the door before you go, she said. She went out to, he went out to the shed and pulled out the mower while Nanny Grace got in her truck. She started backing out of the driveway, then stopped. 
Dory Benoit stood by the mailbox, her black stringy hair falling around her torn t-shirt. What are you looking for? Nanny Grace asked. Nothing. Ain't I allowed to walk down the road anymore? Nanny Grace continued backing out and drove off in the direction of Route 1. Dory wrapped her knuckles on the mailbox. Knock, knock. She walked slowly over to Jude. Virgil around? No, we haven't seen him in a few days. That figures. Where'd he get off to? Jude kicks some sand absently. Don't know. He doesn't tell us that stuff. Got a mind of his own, huh? What's your auntie all chewed up about? He felt his face redden. Ah, you know. Is she going to sell? Sell what? We're going to sell. Doesn't turn me on, but that's what my mom says. She read his befuddlement. God, I guess you are in a world of your own. Developers want to build a bunch of stuff down here. They're buying out everybody on our road, except the squatters. They're just going to give them the boot. They didn't offer you any nothing? News to me. When are they going to do that? You mean building stuff? You want all that information out of me and you don't even offer me a beer? We don't have any. Besides, it isn't even noon. So, you want to get a head start in case you don't get any later? He wondered what made her hair so stringy. It didn't look dirty. I can give you a can of pop. Never mind. Your auntie create, treating you okay? Or does she make you get down on your knees and pray all the time? Knock it off. She chuckled. Nanny's a good gal, a little strange though. She made me slobber all over her cross and repeat the Lord's Prayer about 50 times. That's what I get for doing a mushroom at home. I should have known better. Mom thought I had a demon, so now I'm branded forever. She grinned. Don't act like you don't know none of that stuff. She didn't tell me shit about it. What do you mean about a mushroom? Never mind, she squinted at him. How about you? You waiting for me to grow a pair of fangs? He shook his head. I got a most lawn. You're telling me Virgil didn't leave any beer in your fridge? I know Nanny wouldn't stand for no whiskey in the house, but plain old beer? Because he owes me one. In fact, he owes me a bunch of beers, a whole fridge full. He felt himself reddening again. For what? She snickered. He just owes me, the son of a bitch. You don't tell me nothing, I don't tell you nothing. What do you want me to tell you? You aren't really related to Nanny Grace. From way back, I am. Oh, well, way back, you mean you're both related to Adam and Eve? Not quite that far. What difference does it make? She shrugged. People wonder how you're related, that's all. A couple people bet it ain't gonna last. He gave the lawnmower a shove. So what am I supposed to do about that? Nothing you could do. Mow the lawn, I guess. Run off somewhere. The cops will drag your ass back and Nanny Grace will do an exorcism on you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Austin Lee, a fourth semester student in poetry. I'm honored to introduce our next reader, Anne-Marie Omen. Anne-Marie, otherwise known as Amo, is a quintuple threat, a multi-award-winning memoirist, essayist, playwright, poet, and educator extraordinaire from the great state of Michigan. I mention Michigan because place infuses Amo's work with its unique spirit. Did you know that Michigan lays claim to the longest freshwater coastline in the country? No wonder water laps the shore of Amos' soul. Michiganders can brag of dramatic sand dunes, summer's best cherries, the Upper Peninsula, and the birthplace of Superman ice cream. But we at Solstice know that Michigan's greatest gift is the mermaid from the Great Lakes, Amory Omen. Wow, thank you, Ellen. That was really lovely. I'm so grateful. Um, first, also, thank you to Megan Q, to Megan, Ellen, and Rhonda for the reading last night, and the Solstice faculty and community, and to every student who musters the courage to pursue this dream. As a tribute to Stephen Dunn, who passed recently, 
who was an icon to many of us and a true friend to Solstice, I'd like to begin with his short poem, Happiness, which seems a benediction for this lovely event. Happiness, a state one must not dare enter with hopes of staying, quicksand in the marshes and all those roads leading to the castle that does not exist. But here it is, as promised, with its perfect bridge above the crocodiles and its doors forever open. And I'll read one other poem. This is a recent poem which will be published this fall in Pensive, a global journal of spirituality and the arts, and it is titled The God of Encounters. One cold night after the open mics, hungry, yes, but high on song and poems, we drove north on Clark Street and thin as a sapling, her jacket hanging like wilt off her shoulders. In the country where we come from, there are myths, warnings about such encounters, how one must be aware. Watch your stuff, watch your heart. We stopped, of course, and she climbed in, told us where she wanted to go, but wasn't sure how to get there. And being newcomers to the city, neither were we. And the address was nebulous, changed often, a flower dropping petals. What should we say of the hour we drove around with her, her body weakening, dozing, then starting up with a shout as though half submerged in water, half rising, now and then oracular, find the green light, turn there. What should we say of her sudden shout, let me out, let me out, pounding the windows. And so we pulled over. I asked if she could find her way and she stared at us, smiled then and murmured as a child would over a toy, soothing a beloved thing, home, home, home. And then as though in a dream, she wavered again, backed away, faded into graffiti and was gone. As though in a dream, we drove on, silent, heartbroken, thinking not all the gods are safe from us, not all are safe at all. Thank you. My name is Hannah Woodcock, a Solstice Fiction student, and I'm honored to introduce my mentor from this last semester, Laura Williams McCaffrey. From the time I first met Laura, I could quickly tell she was gentle and caring and had a sharp eye for details. Laura is not only a stellar teacher and mentor at the Solstice program, but has taught at an alternative homeschooling center for 14 years, at Champlain College for three years, and served as an editor for YA Review Network for three years. She's published three young adult novels and six short stories, won SCBWI's 2014 Magazine Merit Award for Fiction, was selected for the 2007 New York Public Library Books for Teens, and one of her novels was named an International Reading Association Notable Book. Her love for the young, appreciation of their language, and skill at capturing their experiences has been a huge benefit to me, and I can only imagine how many other people she's impacted. I can't wait to hear what Laura has to share. That was so, um, so wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. And I love reading with you all. It's, it's such a pleasure. 
I, I got distracted actually and forgot that I had to read too, <laughs> but here I go. Um, I'm gonna read from my second novel, actually Water Shaper is just a small bit and you don't really need to know um, anything about the novel for this brief scene. Um, the main character is an apprentice storyteller and his father is the storyteller and he's the uh, bird, the main character has been sneaking out to tell forbidden stories and the father wants him to stop. And the other thing is that the father um, is quite sick. Bird's father was heading toward death's gatekeeper. He wouldn't be coming back. A piece of bird demanded, don't leave me. He couldn't say that. He wasn't a boy. I won't let the storytelling line die, I swear, he said. And you'll stop going to Portside, his father insisted. Bird had to give his father ease, even if it meant speaking an oath he'd break. I swear. They kept staring at each other, silent. The sea and gulls were making noise, but far away, as if outside a thin wall. Bird wanted to inherit his father's magic, his stories, and the right to weave new tales. He wanted to find out how magic passed and become a master storyteller. He wanted to turn and run. Once his father passed on the magic, he'd no longer be Tomas Silvertongue. He'd only be a sick man waiting to die. The storyteller reached out, his hand clasped Bird's. Instead of the wasted fingers, Bird felt a burning heat. It was like fire spreading into his throat and heart and belly. Sweat dripped down his face. The burning went through him. He had, uh, he had no arms and no eyes. There was no God and no demon. There were no spirits, no men, no women, no lands. There was him that was heat and heat that was him, burning, burning, burning. Then it was gone. Bird crouched and his father let go of him. Bird's palms were felt raw. They were blistered and tender. They had a new line which crossed the fate, love, and lifelines. It was the one that only the master storyteller had, the line of the tales, and it hurt. And his head hurt. It was full of words. They sailed through him like wild, wheeling hawks. He could never tame them all. His father smiled, but his shoulders drooped. His face looked so old now, it seemed young, like that of a newborn babe. He dropped his walking stick. His hands hung at his sides. They no longer clutched desperately at life. You'll do well, he said. Bird nodded. He felt lost, and he couldn't stop looking at his father's hands, open hands, holding nothing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Allen, a Solstice alum. When I think about Randall Horton, I think about music. In his work, I hear rhythm and bass and a whole damn horn section, even though it's just him. He magically lifts you from here to there before you even know you're going somewhere. Randall's most recent poetry collection, number 289-128, was published by Kentucky Press last fall, and Deadweight, a memoir and essays, is forthcoming from Northwestern University Press in February 2022. He is the only tenured professor in the U.S. with seven felony convictions, and he is passionate about eradicating the language of incarceration that tends to recriminalize those in the legal system. Sadly, I can't list all of his teaching creds or awards here, but I can tell you this. When I was worried that my work would bore him, Randall said he didn't care what I wrote about, but he did care how I wrote. He wanted work with a pulse. And so we're back to music. Doesn't matter what Randall writes, poetry, prose, it's all pulse, all music. I'm honored to welcome the man Parnesia Jones rightly calls one of the baddest minds in poetry, scholarship, and activism, Dr. Randall Horton.
Okay, here I go. <laughs> wow, that was a great uh, introduction, uh, Lisa. Thank you so much, man. Um, I'm like listening to everybody and forgetting I had to read myself. Um, but um, thank you for for being here. Um, it's always a pleasure to read, you know, to read and be among um, these minds and solstice. Uh, I, I sold Mr. Residency. Um, anyway, hopefully soon. But anyway, I'm going to read from my new collection. It's called um, Dead Weight. It'll be coming out in um, February of 2022. Um, and it's uh, sort of a section of it. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I don't have time. Um, but what you need to know is the, the setting is Washington, D.C. Um, it is um, the, the, the early 90s um, doing um, the drug war and the cocaine explosion. And um, in this collection, I'm working out a whole lot of things that are, that are sort of like dead weight in terms of the things I've done in my life, right? So um, I think it's, it's kind of self-evident. So I'm gonna just get started, right? And so it's complicated. Question, is there a clemency for the mute body screaming guilt? I only asked because the first slap recoiled like a car backfiring. The second became a Sunday morning sinner's will after a long night of bourbon, followed by another backfiring slap echoing against the alley and gutted brownstones. Then please don't. Why is not the question I shouted, but the woman being hit three stories below did. Hit or slap might resonate too delicate with the ear, more like beat. Yep, he was beating the living fuck out of her but I didn't do nothing. She stuttered between sobs and I would go get it. And I heard it all. To peer three stories down from the apartment in the abandoned building Ming meant being witness to a man beating a woman to confront the infinite curse of addiction, homelessness, and admit life has spiraled out of control. The above posts on Facebook describe a troubling memory of a fight I witnessed while smoking cocaine in an abandoned building on 14th and P Street in Northwest section of Washington, DC. Without a doubt, the experience is difficult to revisit, let alone write about. And in the post, I leave it unclear as to what I did, if anything, to prevent the assault from occurring. A poet friend from Montgomery, Alabama comes across the post and emails me that same day, finding the passage quite disturbing. She simply asks, what did you do? To be honest, when I emailed her back, I, don't completely, I didn't completely answer the question because to do so would require lengthy explanation more than I wanted to provide in the email that day. To start, she would need to know about Debbie and the rocky relationship between the two of us, how we got sucked into the metaphorical blizzard of cocaine. Debbie and I tried to save each other from the streets, but as I said many times before, two addicts don't make a right. One night at the room we rented on Florida and North Capitol Street, Debbie became enraged during an argument and accused me of cheating on her with another woman. When I reminded Debbie that she sold her body to eat, get high and pay rent, she replied that that was beside the point. We argued a bit before I left for a few hours to avoid a physical altercation only to return to hell half no fury like a woman scorn. Scrawled in red lipstick on the mirror above the sink and all my clothes shredded with a knife and dials in human urine. This was my introduction to that scene. And I wonder what it meant in relation to her and me. A year later, I ran into her on 14th and V Street, an area that always throws me for a loop when I visit busboys and poets today. A restaurant, bookstore, and lounge popular in the Washington, D.C. literary scene. I cannot look at busboys for what it is, but instead what the strip of land once represented. V Street between 13th and 14th was at various times an open air market filled with women and men who sold their bodies, along with those who sold what would be called crack. To understand how far Debbie and I had ventured into the rabbit hole, and to give my poet friend from Alabama context about my post, and to answer her question, I would need to provide some historical perspective. Freebase, Reddit Rock, crack, 
I would explain to my, for, my poor friend that free base is a derivative of powder cocaine, a paste that forms when the powder is cooked. During the early 80s, young hustler chemists learned or were taught that this form of cocaine, once converted to free base rock, produced quick profits. These hustler chemists then began to sell what would be called red rock on the streets to users. This type of cocaine sold well and quickly, so the hustler chemists devised a way to increase profits by producing more rock from the free base using a substance called comeback. The chemical ratio required a delicate balance of trial and error, greed versus reality. I would tell my poet friend that the day cocaine transitioned into red rock isn't known, but the day crack became king in my personal realm is crystal clear. I would tell my poor friend that customers came out of the woodwork, their frames frail, faces gaunt, pupils twinkling as if the secret to everlasting life were being sold on the low low, an amulet of eternal possibility. Wads of cash were procured, procured from liquor store robberies, neighborhood check fraud, three card Monte games played on the bus, family theft, food stamp resale, breaking and entering, abuse of the body, and many unthinkable acts, the prestige needed for the purchase of the beige rock that has suddenly appeared on the streets. My poor friend would need to know that in 1989, once the first stem was lit in a back stairwell of the apartment complex in Southeast DC on Chesapeake Avenue, customers would come running back to the source of this euphoria, not one by one as they did in earlier times, but two by two and three by three, until the 14 gram beige rock disappeared from my hands. It could have been a magic trick minus the abracadabra, but it wasn't. It could have been a Donna going novel, but it wasn't. I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you. My name is Jason Christie, Solstice Fiction student. To my good fortune, I met Sterling Watson in 1990 through the creative writing program at Eckerd College in his hometown of St. Petersburg, Florida, where he also co-founded with Dennis Lehane the Writers in Paradise Conference. As a writer, Sterling's short fiction and nonfiction has appeared in numerous journals and most recently in a collection from Akashic Books entitled Tampa Bay Noir. He is the author of eight novels, including The Committee, which Tampa Bay Times book critic Colette Bancroft named one of the best books of 2020. In his work at the lectern or on a bar stool, Sterling is a master storyteller. He is a literary savant. He has a profound knowledge of writer's craft and passes it on with the principles of a true teacher, unselfishness, non-compromise, and generosity. I'm proud to call him mentor and honored to introduce Sterling Watson. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. That's, that's uh, very kind of you and an and eloquent uh, introduction. I think all of my colleagues, wonderful colleagues, Megan Quinton, of course. I'm going to read a short uh, passage from my novel, Committee. Uh, the committee, the title refers to the Johns Committee, which really did exist. This is a historical novel. Uh, the story takes place in 1958. The Johns Committee was a committee of the Florida State Legislature that gave itself the task of harassing uh, African Americans, communists, and uh, gay people in the state of Florida for about six or seven years. And they, there really was a reign of terror from the from the Johns Committee. This is the opening of chapter 14. People who had ignored the Florida alligator for years now couldn't miss an issue. The Gainesville Sun tried, but couldn't keep up with the agile up to the minute alligator. The student newspaper reported that professors all over the university system were falling into two camps, the militant and the timid. Most of the firebrands were the safest faculty, tenured in departments whose courses gave the least opportunity for controversy. How could a botanist corrupt America's youth? 
The timid were the untenured, the unpublished, and those who got, uh, could not afford to lose jobs that were, for myriad reasons, already none too secure. And though most did not say so, there were professors who agreed with the committee, if not with its methods. The alligator reported all of this and more, and soon the whole university was in a state of watchful waiting, like an army in its trenches before stand to at dawn. Fraternities and sororities returned from summer break, tanned and ready, begin their sybaritic courtship rituals. Professors returned from research travel to prepare for classes. But the usual noisy high spirits of fall were not heard in the hallways of departmental offices. Expressions of impatience for the coming of football were shouted in bars and around Gainesville dinner tables. But even these sounded strange. An air of restraint, almost of paralysis, hung over the campus. A committee of men in Tallahassee had somehow managed to cast a pall over every part of life in the university city, as though a hissing gas had been released in the middle of the night to mix with the ground fog out in the pine forest where the kudzu crept toward the city. And this gas, colorless, odorless, but spiritually and intellectually toxic, had permeated every syllable and thought, and even the smallest of gestures, which only a few months before had been nothing but the dance of a beautiful world. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Carrie Beckford and I'm a 2010 graduate of the Solstice MFA program in creative nonfiction. It is my honor to introduce one of my favorite mentors, Amy Hoffman. Amy is the author of three memoirs, including the critically acclaimed Hospital Time. She was the editor in chief of Women's Review of Books and was also an editor at Gay Community News which is the focus of her memoir, An Army of Ex-Lovers. Amy currently teaches at Emerson College, and she also teaches here at the Solstice MFA program. In a review of Amy's most recent book, The Off Season, author Stephen McCauley says, Hoffman's real triumph is reminding us of the importance of community in the face of hostility and oppression. Amy Hoffman is a gifted writer and teacher whose writing highlights the profound and underscores the sublime qualities of life. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's so great to see you and thank everyone for these wonderful readings. Um, I want to give you a little glimpse of my mother. She died last November and I've been thinking about her. My mother and I are alike in one way. She wasn't, and I am not, a crier. I saw my mother cry only twice in her life. The first time when her own mother died, I was 10. She stood in the doorway of my bedroom, tears welling in her eyes. Your grandmother, she said. I didn't know what to do. I had never before seen an adult in need of consolation. That went only one way, in my experience, from adults to children, and not between children. Our role was to tease and torment and cause the tears in the first place. She knelt to hug me. I felt I should cry too, but I hadn't known my grandmother very well. There were such barriers between us, of language, of experience. I was growing up a safe, beloved, suburban girl. No pogroms, no poverty, no steerage, no piecework, no Yiddish. And we children were always admonished to respect our elders. Familiarity was not appropriate. My mother believed her mother was a victim of malpractice, but in those days, what could you do? The doctor was the doctor. And according to my mother, my grandmother used to say that a woman should not live long anyway. Once she turns 40, said my grandmother, a woman is of no use to anyone. You should take her out and shoot her like a horse, like the decrepit horses of the shtetl where she had grown up. 
The second time I saw my mother cry when I was, was when I took women's studies in college. I showed her a story we had read, I Stand Here Ironing, by Tilly Olson. Like the narrator, my mother ironed a lot. In fact, she often claimed that the most valuable thing she had learned in college was from a thesis in home economics that she had picked up at random because she was trying to figure out the correct format for her own. It was a time and motion study that had determined the most efficient way to iron a man's shirt. She taught me, her eldest daughter, the method. But when she tried to teach it to my brother Josh as he was packing for college, he said, I'll find a girlfriend to iron my shirts. Girls don't do that anymore, my mother said grimly. And in that she agreed with women's live, although generally she disapproved of it because she believed it was the duty of a Jewish woman to marry and renew the world Jewish population. She thought my enthusiasm for it, for it would make me into a child le childless lesbian, which it's true I did become, although not necessarily because of women's liberation. My mother must have thought I was trying to tell her something with that story, in which the narrator worries as she pushes the iron back and forth that she hasn't sufficiently loved her eldest daughter, Emily. But at 19, Emily's age, I was less interested in the mother's worries than in the dark and thin and foreign-looking Emily. Her mother describes her as shy, responsible, but with an extraordinary blossoming humor and charm. I wondered, when would mine blossom? I longed not for my mother's regret, but for her admiration, not for her unconditional mother love, which she distributed equally among, her, among each of her six children, but for her specific appreciation of my intimate, unique self, even, no, especially, as I did more and more things that either baffled her or that she viscerally rejected. Smoke pot, have sex with boys, drop out of college, have sex with girls. Not that I discussed any of this with her, but she knew. Thank you. My name is Sam Cook, and I'm a graduate of the Solstice MFA program with a concentration in writing for young people. Today I have the joy of introducing Quentin Collins, a fellow Solstice graduate and current assistant director of the program. Besides helping to run the Solstice MFA program, planning virtual residencies, and being a father and a partner, Quentin is also one of the first people in any situation to jump up and offer help. When I myself was moving to the Boston area, he was the first person to reach out and see how I was liking my new city and to share a warm welcome. On top of all of that, Quinton dedicates his time, energy, and talent to his own work. His most recent collection of poems, The Dandelion Speaks of Survival, expertly and lyrically does exactly what the title suggests, speaks of survival. Most recently, Quinton won a Pushcart Prize for his poem, Pluto Be Orbit Uncommon. Quinton's next collection of poems, Claim Tickets for Stolen People, will be published in spring 2022. The variety in Quinton's work not only speaks to who he is as a poet, but who he is as a human, humble, gracious, hardworking, and a damn good person. Please join me in welcoming Solstice MFA Assistant Director, Quentin Collins. Here we go. Uh, thank you, Sam, for that wonderful introduction. And also thank you for managing things on Zoom for us tonight and the background. So I'm gonna read just a couple of poems from The Dandelion Speaks of Survival. And the first one is called Adrift in Waves. And the only thing you really need to know is that um, waves refers to a hairstyle, shorter hairstyle um, that presents as a wavy texture and requires a lot of brushing. So this is a drift in waves. Brush with the grain, all day, every day, brush black hair ocean, hair like God's fingers in the Red Sea, brush till you wave, brush after showers, get that hair wet, brush in water, it tells hair how to live. Brush and pomade, 
wax thick, brush hair thick. Girls' fingers will surf your scalp if you do it right. Brush till 360 storm surge. Brush till all your homies seasick. Brush till you tidal wave, head ripples. Brush in class, in gym, on the bus. Brush so you can tsunami the girls after school. Wave to your homies. Chop it up about choppy waters. Hairlines a shoreline at high tide. Spend a dub at the barber to curb your current. Fade, fresh, brush, swirl to line. Full head hurricane. Brush till bristles bend like palm trees in a tropical storm. Wave, cap it overnight. Wake and brush. And I'm going to conclude with another poem um, related to hair. And this one is called Praise for My Father's Hands. Praise for my father's hands that gripped the comb. Its teeth gathered knotted strands on my head, demand my hair straighten. My ear tucked beneath his thumb, the clipper chatter. His thumb and forefinger cradle my forehead, tip my head back so the lighting behaves. Praise his fingers on my temples, tilting my head forward. The clippers that cut my unkempt kitchen. Praise blade oil, the brush that clears cut strands, the bristles, the quick sweeps. Praise the next clipper stroke. My father squat in eye level stare before he starts again. Clippers quiet as he charts another stroke. Praise my itchy scalp. The dandruff dots the bath towel tucked into my t-shirt. Hair patches tumble down my chest. Praise my nodding head, that lull, that full body tingle as I drift. My father's hand lifts my chin, chides me to keep my head up. His pride as he holds the mirror. Praise my praise, but not because I am satisfied with the cut, but because I am tired of swinging my legs from the stool. My father shakes out the towel, praise the broom. My scalp prickly beneath my fingers, Praise my father's fingers and palms as they smooth Vaseline over my head. Praise his hands, their care, their calluses, their dirt, their steadiness, their grip. Praise the clippers buzzing again, my father before the mirror, the blades bound for his head. Thank you. Hello, my name is Naja Phillips. I am a third semester Solstice MFA poetry student. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing one who I have personally dubbed a master of memory for the meticulous way his work fishes the depths of human consciousness and expresses what he has explored. I have had the opportunity to meet and be enriched by the same precision and his feedback my first semester at Solstice. Ian Haley Pollitt lives in Mount Kisco, New York, and teaches English at Rye Country Day School. He is the author of two poetry collections, Ghosts Like a Place, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award, and Spit Back a Boy, winner of the 2010 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. Individual poems have appeared in American Poetry Review, Boston Review, and the New York Times Magazine. Ian received his undergraduate degree at Haverford College and his MFA in creative writing at Syracuse University, where he won the Joyce Carol Oates Award. He was the Solstice MFA program's first Cave Canem partner poet and joined the MFA faculty in summer 2012. Give a warm welcome to Ian Haley Pollock. Thank you, Naja. I'm, I'm going to have to grab that introduction because I think you summed up um, in your first sentence what I'm, I was, what I'm trying to do with my poems better than I've heard anyone else do it. Uh, it it's so wonderful to be here. As Naja mentioned, um, 10 years ago, I was the first Kaveh Kanem, um partner poet. And so as we're celebrating our, our 15th year anniversary, this, this, this more minor anniversary for me is, is uh, special. And I'm, I'm happy to be in the warm embrace of, of, solstice, of solstice once again, um, albeit virtually. Thanks to Meg and, and Q for setting um, 
such a great direction for the program and, and keeping things afloat during, during a hard time. And thank you to the poetry workshop for the last four days during what was a, probably the hardest um, school year of my, my career as a, as a high school educator. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, restorative to come back and, and be with such dedicated poets for the last four days. Um, one thing we talked a lot about was vulnerability. So in, in the spirit of that, and because um, the vision of the poem I'm gonna read is, is so dark, I wanted one moment of levity. I, I mentioned um, a Malcolm X hat that was popularized after Spike Lee's movie came out. And my mom dug up a picture of it that she was trying to use to shame me with my kids. So I sh thought I'd just publicly shame myself, although it's on Instagram already. So here you go, here's me. Here's the, uh, here's the hat, oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. That's some old guy. Uh, you saw me for a second. Um, um, the other weird coincidence is that um, I'm writing about I mentioned the night that Michael Jackson dies and the poem is really about Michael Jackson. And I think Randall, we were together at a Kaveh Khanum retreat on the, on the night that uh, Michael Jackson died. So I, I think you'll remember one of the moments that's, that's in here. Never can say goodbye, double plus sonnet. Half my bad racial memories from childhood happened at middle school dances. The blonde boy who snatched the fresh Malcolm X hat off my head, threw it down into a dance floor mess of fruit punch and footprints and told me, you're not black, stop pretending. Entire careers made of policing that line when we refused to run patrol for them. At another dance, I was ringed by leering white faces that belted out, it don't matter if you're black or white. I wasn't sure what those faces meant, but I knew they meant to hurt. I've never held that lyric against Michael Jackson. I do find though, listening to his old albums, those Jackson 5 records with cuts like never can say goodbye has gotten hard. These days, I know how that story ends. The descent into dysmorphic madness, the predatory doors locked behind boys, one stolen childhood thieving another. My better angels think it's wrong to separate the art from the artist. I hated learning pound in school when we all knew he was a fascist and anti-Semite. He should have stayed locked in the gorilla cage of his hate. But then I admit Miles Davis has lodged brass notes irrevocably under my fifth rib. And some of those notes he bent while blacking and bluing Cicely Tyson. Cicely goddamn Tyson. And on the night MJ died, I danced to his music in a circle of dancers until my shirt was sweat stuck to my chest, until I stank with grief. I didn't know then all that now disgusts father me, the doors, the boys. But the hard truth is, if the king of pop died today, I don't think I could stop myself from letting my hips sway to music that, especially in the writhing all night body rock of a house party, but even in my mother's shy mezzo soprano, push past joy to abandon. These moral currents run the other way too. The blonde boy who snatched the X hat off my head when a young man, walked into a gas station store to find a woman being beaten by her boyfriend. And when the blonde boy went to stop him, the boyfriend ignited a lighter and touched it to the boy's shirt, which burned until it curled into a sneer and then stuck to his white skin. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Megan LaDuke, a SOLSA student and the program's intern. Today I am honored to introduce my mentor and faculty member, David Yu. 
David is the author of the novels Girls for Breakfast, a NYPL best book for teens and a book sense pick, and Stop Me If You've Heard This One Before, a Chicago best of the best selection, along with a middle grade novel, The Detention Club. His first collection of essays, The Choke Artist, was a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award. David is also a devoted family man, a former tennis instructor, an amateur comedian, and a gifted writer with many pearls of wisdom. In one of our cover letter exchanges, he writes, you chose writing as opposed to some job where the goalposts are marked clearly. To be a writer is to embrace the unknown. And for those who can stand it, it's both a curse and a gift. I would be bored to tears with life in any other vocation, but I'd likely have less gray hair. David constantly reminds us that we are living. We are doing what we love and encourages us to take the time to enjoy it. Please welcome David Yu. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Um, I, uh, I just finished teaching the first half of residency. Um, I just mentioned that to rub it into the faculty who are about to start uh, tomorrow. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, so tonight I'm going to read a bit from an essay I wrote a while ago. Um, it's about the frustrations of being an Asian American teenager in the late 1980s, early 90s, um, which means as of 2020, this essay is a little bit outdated. But anyway, I had the misfortune of attending high school in the late 1980s in New England, which in hindsight has to be considered the worst time in history to be an Asian American boy growing up in a white bread town like the one I grew up in, because people seem to have only two Asian guys in their lives, me and Long Duck Dong from 16 Candles. To be perfectly fair, especially cultured people were also familiar with a Japanese guy in Revenge of the Nerds, along with the kid who played Data in The Goonies. Anytime strangers saw me at McDonald's or at the library or wherever, I was fairly certain a gong was going off in their heads. Back then, Anytime friends were due to visit, I desperately tried to remove all traces of my family's heritage inside our house, figuring it was obvious enough we were Asian. Why shove it in their faces like that? My mom was perpetually at her wits end trying to get me to clean my room, but the prospect of having a sleepover would bring out the Mary Poppins in me, as I'd secretly cart all the ancient family heirlooms down into the basement. I'd pull together the fancy rice paper wall in my dad's office and stuff it in the closet and take down any framed pictures of us in traditional Korean hanbok outfits, slying them under the sofa in the living room. The ring of the doorbell was downright Pavlovian as I'd race to the kitchen to abscond with a big stinky jar of kimchi from the fridge into the bathroom, where I'd then proceed to methodically stuff cold handfuls of the spicy cabbage down the toilet with my bare hands. I didn't see myself as a typical Asian kid. I was aware, of course, that I looked blatantly Korean, but I didn't believe, despite all indications to the contrary, that I looked quite as Asian as other full-blown Asian kids. And it actually confused me in history class when I read in a sorely outdated textbook a reference to Asian people having yellow skin. While I may have been deluded in how people saw me, surely I wasn't colorblind too. I was suddenly mortified I would one day wake up with yellow skin so I started regularly conducting a homemade test whenever the thought came to me, where I drew a line on my forearm with a yellow highlighter. The rationale being that if one day I couldn't see the line, then the prophecy had come true. I figured Native American kids, if the textbooks were right, had it even worse than me. If they wanted to do the test, they'd have to scribble red marker all over their arms. My greatest aspiration was not to become a pro athlete or a doctor or rock star, but simply to have dull brown hair and dangerously fair skin. Being Asian, I reasoned, was a physical handicap that hurt my chances of becoming popular in the same way other people's physical handicaps killed their chances of climbing the social ladder. My Asian face was no different from the girl with a gigantic purple splotch on her forehead or obese kids or the freckly redhead in my grade who was mercilessly tortured for vaguely resembling the actor Eric Stoltz. But no matter what I did to hide my Korean face, 
be it wearing baseball caps with a brim pulled low to hide my eyes, which were already always shielded by sunglasses, even indoors. Everyone still saw me as the token Asian guy. By the time junior year started, I realized I had to find another way to change how people saw me. And it was around this time when I discovered gangsta rap. Thank you. I am Rhonda McDonald, a graduating Solstice student, and it is my honor to present the award-winning poet Laurent Bacillard, our beloved Belgian, whose passion for language and life infuses all that she does. Recently, as poet laureate of Santa Barbara, she edited the anthology While You Wait for Medical Waiting Rooms. Rather than being derailed by pandemic restrictions, she moved the anthology online and placed posters with QR codes in waiting rooms. Her four books of poetry invite readers into her innermost memories and emotions with such intimacy and generosity that to read her is to receive a gift to one's soul. As the poet Charles Simic has said of her, she writes wise poems about memory, poems whose art lies in their ability to make these memories ours too. What more could any one of us ask of poetry? Ah, oh, Rhonda, thank you. That was so warm and, and kind and but I do feel some nostalgic because you're, you're graduating and all these students graduate and then go. Um, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Meg, for your talent of bringing us all together. And thank you, Quinton, for your patience and uh, un unchanging smile you smile through everything and I love that and it calms us all down and thank you for everybody who read today I'm kind of feeling um flattered to be among that group the first poem I'm going to read is for Quinton um and here's that strange things um that happen with with writers is that while I had finished reading that the poem I'm going to read to you and Maybe a week later, I learned about the title of Quinton's book that speaks of a dandelion. And there's a dandelion in my poem too. So um, this is for you, Quinton. Uh, the marine layer is a layer of fog that comes in from the Pacific and goes up to the mountains and then slowly is burned out by the sun and it happens mostly in June and July in, um, no, in May and June in Santa Barbara. To the marine layer. Look, I might not have woken up early enough to watch you hang your rags over the hedge or witnessed you loiter in the yards waning night, but I'm here now, so linger a little. Linger by my window, stay, blur nature's bright drop cloth a while longer, fade the jay's coat and the fern's deep jade, and wait for me. I'll come walk inside you, wrapped in my gray scarf, drizzled, breathing in your ocean whiffs, eyes closed, smiling at nothing. No, at everything, while the dog chases her first squirrel of the day. Stay, soak the yard with dew before the sun blisters it away and light blasts us all with, with what will be the colors of the day. A tear's trace on a caged child's face, the drained reds of violence, the wild fabrics of a million masks, and the dandelions, defiant gold, blazing out of a concrete crack. My second poem needs a very small introduction. Um, my 
one of my two um, mother tongues is French, the other one is Flemish. And in French, things have genders and death is feminine. Like in Spanish, la muerte. Late afternoon stroll on the cliffs. As usual, death sweetly slips her arm in mine and we take a deep breath from the eucalyptus breeze. We bo both worked honestly at our jobs. All day death destroyed traffic with wailing ambulances while I killed hours and lines on eight and a half by 11 inch pages. We're fast friends by now. Death much older, of course, but there's no hierarchy between us. We're both taking a break from it all. Glad to watch waves collapse on rocks and pelicans dive bomb fish. I try to be sensitive to death's guilt, that whole pandemic disaster that she can no longer control. She'll soon betray me too, like she will you, I know. But today, the gulls are like silver angels etching great cursive blessings in a perfect sky. So Beth and I make believe we believe that and amble on. Thank you, everybody. Hello again, and thank you so much to all of our readers. Thank you again to our Zoom admin, Sam Cook. And thank you all for joining us tonight. This concludes the reading by faculty and staff at our summer 2021 residency. Again, it's our wonderful 15th year. And um, thank you again for joining us and be safe and be well tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>